Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This evening, we turn to a very important and very central concept in the objectivist ethics, namely the virtue of justice. This is the one virtue in the objectivist ethics which specifically is a social virtue, by which I mean the one virtue that specifically pertains to men's relationship with one another. Justice is the virtue that the majority of men pay lip service to, but only a rare minority practice. Why? Because justice pertains to one's judgment, not of nature, but of men. Justice is incompatible with the conventional ethics of altruism. It is incompatible with the creed of self-sacrifice. And by the same token, it is the crucial and, as I say, the only specifically social virtue of the objectivist morality. Objectivism holds, as you of course know, that justice and not sacrifice should be the ruling principle in human relationships. Justice, to quote Galt, is, quote, the recognition of the fact that you must judge all men as conscientiously as you judge inanimate objects with the same respect for truth, with the same incorruptible vision, by as pure and as rational a process of identification. That every man must be judged for what he is and treated accordingly. That just as you do not pay a higher price for a rusty chunk of scrap than for a piece of shining metal, so you do not value a rotter above a hero. Close quote. The immediate protest of the mystic altruist contingent would be, oh no, how cruel and materialistic to judge men as one judges inanimate objects. Well, let's understand the full and exact meaning of such a protest. Since presumably we judge inanimate objects rationally and objectively, the only alternative is to judge men irrationally and non-objectively, to ignore what they are, to disregard their character, in a word, to judge them unjustly. The mystic altruist definition of justice, as opposed to Galt's, would read something like the following. You must not judge men as conscientiously as you judge inanimate objects. Truth is not the only consideration. Higher things may be permitted to cloud your vision. You must not judge men by a pure or a rational process of identification. No man must be judged for what he is. Your treatment of him must bear no relation to his character. You must not value a hero above a rotter. It will hurt the rotter's feelings. To judge men as one judges inanimate objects does not mean to judge them as if they were inanimate objects. It means to judge them by the same epistemology, by the same rules of reason and logic. And that is what the mystic altruists dread. And while they prattle that reason is materialistic and mercy is superior to justice, what their theories mean, in fact, in reality, is that inanimate objects deserve the full focus of man's consciousness, but human beings do not. That inanimate objects deserve the effort of man's rational awareness, of logic, of thought, but human beings do not. That inanimate objects are worthy of justice, but human beings are not. No, of course, this is not what the mystic altruists say, but this is what they practice as proof 
look at mankind's progress in the realm of the material sciences, where reason is the standard for judging inanimate objects, then look at mankind's brutality, terror, and despair in the moral realm of human relationships from which reason and justice have been banned. The killer tenet in this issue is the slogan that mercy is superior to justice. Like self-sacrifice, it is a precept that has been smuggled into men's minds by degrees, through the back door, by means of sloppy definitions, woozy generalities, evasions, and emotional package dealing. Just as most people believe that self-sacrifice means nothing more than some vague sort of kindness, like giving dimes to beggars or contributing to charity drives, and do not realize by what steps they are being pushed into a sacrificial furnace, so most people believe that mercy means nothing more than some vague sort of forgiveness toward petty and repentant offenders. But this is not what mercy means. Even among its advocates, few care to admit to themselves or to others what it actually does mean. The example of mercy which its advocates usually offer is as follows. A judge has the power to sentence a young first offender to serve a jail term of from two to ten years, but he considers mitigating circumstances and gives him the shorter rather than the longer term. Most people accept this as an example of mercy, but this is not an act of mercy, it is an act of justice. If there are circumstances mitigating the boy's guilt, it would be unjust to impose on him a punishment heavier than he deserves. It is precisely in order to weigh mitigating circumstances that judges are given latitude in the choice of punishment. A judge who, in this same case, would impose a 10-year sentence, ignoring the evidence in favor of the boy, would not be unmerciful, but unjust. Justice is not arbitrary. It is not a favor. It is not arbitrary kindness, nor arbitrary severity. Justice consists of pronouncing judgment in accordance with all the relevant facts in accordance with reality. Mercy, on the other hand, is arbitrary. Mercy is a favor. It consists of granting an unearned and undeserved kindness, a kindness contrary to facts and to reality. Mercy consists of kindness superseding reality. If a so-called merciful judge gave the lightest sentence in his power to a hardened criminal in defiance of all the evidence proving that the man was a monster, that would be mercy. And if a year later a merciful parole board set the criminal free, that would be mercy. And if, a month later, the criminal murdered three people while holding up a store and robbing the cash register of $6.75, that would be the result of mercy. Well, today's law courts and newspapers are full of such instances of mercy. If an employer forgives an employee for an accidental error, the first in six months of efficient and conscientious service, that is not mercy but justice. If an employer keeps forgiving the constant errors of an incompetent employee who does not propose to focus on his work, that is mercy. If you do not know how to judge the character of a person because the facts available to you are insufficient, and the evidence of his flaws is inconclusive, you must give him the benefit of the doubt, not on the ground of mercy, but on the ground of justice, because to let off the guilty is less disastrous than to condemn the innocent, because virtues are more important than flaws. 
because justice demands that a man be considered innocent until proved guilty. And this principle applies in law courts as well as in your personal relationships with people. Except that in personal relationships, when you give the benefit of the doubt, you do not dismiss the case. You wait for further evidence to prove the good or bad character of the person before you pass a moral judgment. Mercy is a concept that applies to and is called upon only by the evil, never by the good. If a man has committed a heroic or virtuous deed, what he asks is justice, not mercy. If a man has committed a despicable or vicious deed, what he dreads is justice and what he cries for is mercy. The desire for mercy is always the desire to escape from the objective facts of reality. There is the old joke about the friend who looks at the portrait of a woman and says to her, it's a wonderful portrait that really does you justice, whereupon the woman replies angrily, I didn't want justice, I wanted mercy. Now I will read to you a dictionary definition of mercy and ask you to listen carefully and observe the implications of the concepts used. It's a good test for you as you listen to this definition of your ability to grasp philosophical implications. This is from the American College Dictionary. Quote, Mercy, one, Compassion or kindly forbearance shown toward an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. Compassion, pity, or benevolence. Two, disposition to be merciful. Three, discretionary power as to clemency or severity, pardon or punishment, or the like. Four, an act of forbearance, compassion, or favor, especially of God toward his creatures." Close quote. Observe two concepts that are central to this definition, guilt and arbitrary power. Guilt is implied by such terms as forbearance, offender, pity, clemency, pardon, punishment. These terms are not applicable to virtue or to innocence. They are applicable only to those who are guilty of some crime or wrong or evil. Arbitrary power is implied by such phrases as an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. Discretionary power as to clemency or severity pardon or punishment, an act of forbearance, compassion, or favor, especially of God toward his creatures." Close quote. What picture of the judged and the judges does this definition project? The judged are wretches who are guilty of evils that deserve punishment, who can hope for kindness only as an undeserved favor. The judges are omnipotent dictators who hold these wretches in their discretionary power, a power akin to God's, and who dispense forbearance, compassion, clemency, pardon, as an arbitrary favor of their arbitrary whim. This is the exact meaning of mercy and the exact motive of those who advocate it, and this is what we are asked to place above justice. Mercy, which you hear extolled as a moral virtue, is an anti-moral concept. It pertains to and implies moral anarchy, a view of existence where moral values are inoperative, where men's fate is not determined by their virtues or vices, and men need not consider the consequences of their actions, since virtues may not necessarily bring rewards and vices may not necessarily bring punishment, since causality may be suspended by a power superior to moral principles. 
the power of the arbitrary whim of who? Well, whoever gets himself into the position of ruler over men willing to live at his mercy. Now, the logical question to ask yourselves is this. Who would have a vested interest in upholding this sort of view? Who would have reason to long for an escape from morality and to hope that a deserved retribution may somehow be diverted from his head? Only the man who is guilty and intends to remain guilty. Only the man who has committed evil and intends to continue committing evil. Mercy is a blank check on and a license to evil. As in the case of any other vicious, irrational concept, the men who uphold mercy long for both sides of the coin and see themselves in both roles, as the judged and the judges, as the recipients and as the dispensers of unearned favors. They expect a chance to be in both positions according to where they might land in the future a chance to dispense the undeserved to groveling wretches as insurance against the day when it will be their turn to grovel. Judge not that ye be not judged. Now who has no interest in this view of existence? Whose interests are not included in the concept of mercy? Who is eloquently absent from the definition of mercy that I read? The innocent and the virtuous. They are the men who do not need mercy, but who do need justice. It is the men of innocence and the men of virtue who need acknowledgement and recognition, who need to be treated for what they are, who need no favors, only the justice of receiving that which they have earned and deserved, that which is theirs by right. These are the men whose existence the concept of mercy blanks out. There is a reason for that blank out. All evils are committed against men, not against physical nature or inanimate objects. You cannot be evil toward a table, a chair, or a chunk of stone only toward a human being. Every act of evil has victims. And if one is to give an undeserved benefit, any kind of undeserved benefit, to an evildoer, one has to take it away from his victims. One has to do it at the expense of his victims. Consider this carefully. There is no exception to this rule. For instance, if a man steals $100, is caught, and the judge orders him to return $80, but out of mercy allows him to keep 20 it is from the victim of the theft that these $20 are taken. Now, this, of course, is the simplest example, but it is the exact and irrevocable pattern of any act of mercy. The principle involved is an absolute, and what obscures it is the fact that most of the actual instances of mercy are much more complex, and therefore, the harm of the victims is not as directly immediately perceivable. What obscures it further is the fact that the injustice involves spiritual as well as material benefits granted to the guilty at the expense of the innocent. Justice is a moral principle. All moral principles deal with values by which one guides one's choices and actions. Moral values determine our evaluations of our fellow men, their importance to us, and our attitude and policies toward them. Take the example I cited earlier of the judge who was merciful toward a criminal which resulted in the murder of three innocent victims. To be merciful, the judge had to drop the context of the man's crime, ignore the harm which the man had done his victims, and be concerned only with the man's interest, forgetting the interests of his victims. Whether the judge intended it consciously or not, his action meant, in fact, that he considered the criminal important but the victims unimportant. 
that the undeserved concern he granted to the criminal reduced by that exact degree the concern he owed to the victims. That in terms of moral appraisal, he evaluated the criminal as more than the man actually was by means of evaluating the victims as less than they actually were. The first spiritual consequence of this injustice is the bitterness and disillusionment of the victims, who would rightfully feel that the light penalty imposed on the criminal for the heavy injury he had done to them meant that the society of their fellow men, by the verdict of the judge as society's representative, did not care about them, the victims, did not consider them important, did not choose to defend them. They would feel it necessarily, whether they identified it consciously or not, because such were the facts and such is the nature of the feeling of any man who has ever suffered an injustice. This feeling is the start or the confirmation of that sense of hopelessness and suspicion which most men feel toward one another. Hopelessness in regard to ever finding justice or fairness. Suspicion in regard to always watching out for unexpected, unprovoked injury or malice. Such is the first consequence of the judge's mercy and the manner in which the spiritual benefit of the guilty is granted at the expense of the innocent. The undeserved pleasure of the criminal at his light sentence, the feeling of, I got away with it, and the undeserved pain of the victims, the feeling of moral loneliness, of the feeling, there's nobody to defend me. The ultimate consequence of the judge's mercy is the murder of the three innocent men by the released criminal. It is not an accidental consequence. Whether any evader, such as that judge, chooses to think of it or not, every value judgment reflects a moral principle. And a principle is an abstraction that applies to a countless number of concretes. And there are no out-of-context judgments because the full context of any situation continues to exist in reality whether any evader had dropped it or not. Therefore, by his action, the judge had upheld, declared, and put into reality the principle that the good is to be subordinated and sacrificed to the evil. It is only a matter of time and degree until this principle leads to its ultimate consequences and it is of no importance whether the three murdered victims were three new persons or the same men whom the criminal had victimized earlier. What is important is that all the victims were concrete representatives of the same moral abstraction which the judge's mercy had ignored and sacrificed. They were innocent men. It is not revenge that the victims of evil need but moral support. The sense that their fellow men stand by them, take seriously an offense against them, and punish it severely. It is the sense of living in a moral society. The meaning of imposing on a criminal a punishment commensurate with the seriousness of his crime is not just to make him suffer, though he deserves it, but to give an objective, factual expression to the moral principle that the evil are not to benefit by their evil, that no man may violate the rights of another with impunity, that the physical and spiritual consequences of evil are to be borne by the evildoer, not by his victims, and that a society of moral men will not go by in passive indifference and let the victims absorb the pain which the criminal has caused them and which is often irreparable. Let me illustrate the proceeding in the following way. Suppose that some drunken driver, say an irresponsible playboy with political connections, runs over your child and kills him in an accident caused by wanton deliberate negligence. He shows no regret or repentance, has no mitigating excuses to offer, but is let off without punishment due to his political connections. You will feel a just and terrible indignation against the courts and against society in general. 
If then you discover one day that your best friend is running around with that playboy, will you be able to continue the friendship? Or will you feel that if he valued you at all, he would never tolerate the man who caused you so profound a suffering? You would drop your friend, of course, and the bitter indignation you would feel against him is the feeling of being let down, abandoned, denied the moral solidarity one had expected and deserved, which is experienced by all victims of unpunished evils on a personal and social scale. An unpunished wrong is a shrug of indifference at the pain of the right. And this is the kind of social poison that every act of mercy to an evildoer spreads through a society. If goodwill among men is a desirable social state, then no such goodwill is possible if men lose respect for the moral caliber of their fellow men. If they come to regard one another, not as well-meaning friends, but as amoral, indifferent cynics. The collapse of moral standards is necessarily to the disadvantage of the good men and to the advantage of the evil. Such are the spiritual consequences of mercy to criminals, the discouragement and disillusionment of the virtuous element in people, the encouragement of the vicious element. The practical physical consequences are obvious. Mercy is a license to further evil, as you can read in terms of the results clearly in any newspaper. Now, if you understand the workings of mercy, consider a few more examples. If you succumb to pleas for mercy toward juvenile delinquents, what is your moral injustice toward the victims they have robbed or murdered, toward the families, the friends, and all those who had loved those victims? How much concern do you give them? How lightly do you evaluate their pain? To what embittered loneliness are you willing to abandon them? Or, if you hear pleas for mercy toward communists and Nazis, toward men who had heard or evaded the screams of millions of innocent victims that had been tortured in concentration camps, torture chambers, and gas chambers, and had seen or evaded the blood of those victims on their own hands, if you hear pleas for mercy for such people, whether in the form of an action or merely in the form of spiritual kindness, just a touch of pity in your soul to replace the merciless loathing they deserve, what moral injustice are you willing to commit toward those victims? Would you be able to feel that pity while visualizing clearly, fully, and specifically those torture cellars, the blood, the screams, the twisted bodies, and the distorted faces of the victims? No, you couldn't? Then that is the proof I wanted to give you, that one can feel pity or mercy for the guilty only at the price of ignoring, evading, and forgetting the fate of the innocent, that any undeserved benefit to the evil is granted at the expense of the good. This last is especially relevant today when one hears so many pleas for kindness or, quote, understanding, close quote, toward communists. And what is blanked out by these apostles of humanitarianism who plea for this kindness or mercy, what is blanked out is the amount of blood morally on the hands of any adult human being sympathetic to communism in the modern world. What is blanked out is how many million victims at this point. That is what has to be evaded totally in order to talk about kindness or mercy toward the sympathizers with dictatorships. You can now appreciate more fully the meaning of Reardon's thoughts in the following passage from Atlas Shrugged, quote, when one acts on pity against justice, it is the good whom one punishes for the sake of the evil. When one saves the guilty from suffering, it is the innocent whom one forces to suffer. There is no escape from justice, 
Nothing can be unearned and unpaid for in the universe, neither in matter nor in spirit. And if the guilty do not pay, then the innocent have to pay it." Close quote. Such is the meaning of mercy, the penalizing of virtue for being virtue, the rewarding of vice for being vice, the sacrifice of the good to the evil. And such is the full meaning of the slogan that mercy is superior to justice. A symptom of the degree to which this monstrous doctrine has permeated our culture is the fact that most people think of justice only as an issue pertaining to law courts, to criminals, to the punishment of evil, to dealing with negatives. And few people ever think of justice toward the good. Yet that is the primary moral purpose and meaning of justice. Justice consists of acknowledging the good, not merely of denouncing the evil, of rewarding virtue, not merely of punishing vice, of fostering the positive, not merely of stopping the negative. What, after all, is justice in relationship to the basic standard of man's life? Why is justice a cardinal virtue? Because justice is the policy of rewarding those actions of men which are pro-life and of condemning or penalizing those actions of men which are anti-life, of supporting, complimenting, encouraging, praising that which is good, meaning, that which is conducive to, contributory to, in accordance with man's survival, condemning, punishing, denouncing that which is inimical to man's life and survival. And justice is not the monopoly of law courts. Law courts are only its final expression and result. Its source and practice is in the moral judgments of individual men. And these moral judgments determine the kind of law courts men will get. In his relation with others, every man must be a judge, a moral judge, a function the mystics and altruists have good reason to fear. And justice, not mercy, must be your standard of appraisal, which means that you must judge every man for what he is and treat him accordingly. You must regard the act of your moral appraisal as solemnly as the strictest, most honorable judge regards his responsibility in a court of law, and you must carry out the verdicts you pass. Your moral approval or disapproval is your only means of rewarding virtue and punishing evil and it is a much more potent weapon than most of you probably suspect. Not only will it bring pleasure or pain, support or discouragement to those you meet in person, and if you are just, will have importance for both the good men and the evil, but the standard of justice in a whole society will be determined by those who have the courage and accept the responsibility of passing moral judgments. If today we live in an age of outrageous injustice, it is because the mystic altruists are setting the moral standards and the better men are keeping silent. Therefore, in place of the slogan, judge not that ye be not judged, objectivism answers, judge and be prepared to be judged. And more, be prepared to be judged for your judgments. Because one of the solemn responsibilities entailed in the act of passing moral judgments, and one of the reasons why most men are frightened to pass them, is precisely because any third person is then able to look at your judgment, uh, to look at the object of your judgment, and to judge you on the basis of the kind of judgment you have passed. And that is precisely the responsibility which many men dread. The recognition, the acknowledgement, the loyalty, the admiration which you owe to those who deserve such responses, to men of virtue and achievement, are a much more important act of justice than the mere condemnation of evil. The positive is always much more important than the negative. 
It is much more important to express in action, to translate into reality, your admiration for John Galt than your contempt for Wesley Mouch. But by the same token, you must never fail to express your contempt for Wesley Mouch and never soften it with any mercy, because if you do, that is an act of treason to Galt and to all the men of virtue in the world. If you feel concern for suffering, be concerned first with the suffering of the virtuous, with the suffering of a genius, with the suffering of a Hank Reardon, and give thought to relieving it before you start worrying about the suffering of the village idiot or of James Taggart. There can be no darker immorality and injustice than the idea that the men of greatness, of ability, of achievement deserve no concern by reason of their greatness, ability, and achievement, and that the mediocrities deserve concern by reason of their mediocrity. That is the penalizing of virtue for being virtue. It is the virtue of justice that represents the most profound cleavage between the objectivist ethics and the mystic altruist collectivist axis. Justice is the concept they cannot accept or touch or approach, not any inch or part of it, because the whole of the altruist collectivist doctrine rests on injustice to human ability and achievement, rests on the concepts of mercy, charity, expropriation, rests on the necessity of unpaid supporters, unrewarded producers, unacknowledged keepers of, and sacrificial animals to, the weaknesses, flaws, defaults, and depravities of their brothers. Justice is the concept which the altruist collectivists ignore, evade, blank out, and squirm to escape, as in medieval legends, the devil was supposed to squirm at the sight of holy water. The cause of the most savage attacks which you may have heard leveled against objectivism, all those attacks which are hidden behind the smokescreen of the alleged issue of selfishness, in fact, all hang on the virulent animosity towards the principle of justice as presented in the objectivist literature. There are too many examples in Miss Rand's novels of the enormous magnanimity and generosity which the heroic characters in the novel show toward the innocent good for anybody honestly to call such characters heartless or cruel or other adjectives of that kind. When they call them heartless or cruel, what the critics will never tell you, but in fact you may know to be a fact, that what is bothering them is not their lack of compassion or kindness or generosity toward the innocent suffering good, which, as I say, the heroes do exhibit, but rather their lack of any such compassion toward the evil, toward characters such as James Taggart. It's precisely the hero's concern for man the victim that makes them so ruthlessly unsympathetic toward man the killer. And it's either or. Either you feel sympathy for the innocent or you feel sympathy for the guilty. If you feel sympathy for the guilty, you can only feel it at the expense of the innocent. Today, as you know, there is a very strong animus against passing moral judgments of any kind whatsoever. Anything can be forgiven or tolerated in our culture except somebody who will pass moral judgments. Let anybody pass an uncompromising moral judgment about anything, and I don't have to tell you that it's upon his neck that all of the humanitarian axes will fall. It is an age of extreme moral cynicism, of mawkish sentimentality towards evil, and 
an age in which anything is to be forgiven, anything is to be understood, except, as I say, anybody who dares to point out that the evil is the evil. Have you ever seen any such virulent demonstrations of hate-mongering as the wrathful accusations against anybody, for example, who chose to remind any liberals that it was, after all, a communist and not a right-winger who assassinated Mr. Kennedy. The same liberals who were talking about hate groups and the poison that they allegedly spread through the atmosphere were guilty of and were spreading across the newspapers and magazines of the country the most hysterical, the most ferocious outpourings of wrath, hatred, denunciations, and curses upon anybody who didn't feel love for everybody. Their policy was love everybody and forgive everything or we'll cut your throats. <laughs> In other words, and to summarize, in our age, anything is to be forgiven except justice. That, more than any other single issue, is what the objectivist ethics is attacked for and criticized for, and that's central to its war with the prevailing values of our culture. We'll take a break now of 10 minutes and then continue. Let us turn now to a discussion of the virtue of pride and its place in the objectivist ethics. The virtue of pride consists of loyalty to one's life, that is, to one's mind, to one's values, to one's happiness. It is an act of pride to value nothing above one's own mind. It is an act of pride to live by nothing but one's values. It is an act of pride to live for nothing but one's happiness. Pride, to quote Galt, is, quote, that radiant selfishness of soul which desires the best in all things, in values of matter and spirit, a soul that seeks above all else to achieve its own moral perfection, valuing nothing higher than itself." Close quote. Pride is, first and foremost, moral ambitiousness. It is the virtue of desiring to be virtuous, of holding one's character as one's proudest achievement. Pride is the ambition for moral perfection. And you must start by understanding what is moral perfection, what it is that you must demand of yourself in order to achieve full self-esteem. Conventional morality holds, as you all know, that moral perfection is impossible to man. And so it is if omniscience and self-immolation are the standard. When you consider the incredible things which conventional morality holds up to men as moral ideals, it's not surprising that the advocates of such a morality are driven to declare that perfection is beyond man's reach. You would think that men would stop and reconsider their position when they discover that they advocate a code that cannot be practiced. But they do not because, among other reasons, 
They have a vested interest in the doctrine of man's necessary imperfection. It provides a marvelous blank check. It opens the way to any irrationality on the premise of who's perfect. An illustration of this, let me tell you a little story. A man who presented himself as staunchly religious was talking one day to a friend of mine. The man began to boast about his many infidelities to his wife. When my friend asked how such behavior was to be reconciled with the man's religious beliefs, the man answered, Oh, but, but I don't aspire to be perfect. That would be the sin of pride. <laughs> Which is just about the neatest answer I have ever heard. <laughs> there are many reasons why there could be a vested interest in the doctrine of the human imperfectibility. One, of course, is that it is, as I have just indicated, a marvelous screen and rationalization for any kind of moral failure. It's also a rationalization to protect the advocates of and mystical morality from having to admit that their morality doesn't make sense. You see, their morality is flagrantly impractical, impracticable, cannot be followed consistently by anybody who wishes to remain alive. Their way out of blaming their morality is to blame human nature instead and say, well, of course it can't be practiced with full consistency. That shows you the intrinsic defect of human nature. So it's human nature rather than their morality which takes the blame. Again, quoting from Galt's speech, quote, Discard that unlimited license to evil which consists of claiming that man is imperfect. By what standard do you damn him when you claim it? Accept the fact that in the realm of morality, nothing less than perfection will do. But perfection is not to be gauged by matters not open to your choice. Man has a single basic choice, to think or not, and that is the gauge of his virtue. Moral perfection is an unbreached rationality not the degree of your intelligence, but the full and relentless use of your mind, not the extent of your knowledge, but the acceptance of reason as an absolute. Learn to distinguish between errors of knowledge and breaches of morality. An error of knowledge is not a moral flaw, provided you are willing to correct it. Only a mystic would judge human beings by the standard of an impossible, automatic omniscience. But a breach of morality is the conscious choice of an action you know to be evil, or a willful evasion of knowledge, a suspension of sight and of thought. That which you do not know is not a moral charge against you, but that which you refuse to know is an account of infamy growing in your soul. Make every allowance for errors of knowledge, do not forgive or accept any breach of morality. Give the benefit of the doubt to those who seek to know, but treat as potential killers those specimens of insolent depravity who make demands upon you, announcing that they have and seek no reasons, proclaiming as a license that they just feel it, or those who reject an irrefutable argument by saying it's only logic, which means it's only reality. Close quote. The first definition, the first meaning, therefore, of the virtue of pride consists of moral ambitiousness. As I say, the virtue of desiring to be virtuous. Let me mention parenthetically, just to cut off a possible misunderstanding, that 
Pride is used in a psychological sense with a somewhat different meaning, a related but different meaning. Here, the concept of pride is used to refer to a virtue. Pride can also be used in a psychological context to designate an emotional state, as when we say, I feel proud of something, of this or that or this achievement. And in such a case, pride means, of course, the emotional response to values one has achieved the pleasure one takes in values that one has achieved, either in action or in one's own character. So that, for example, if you do something very difficult, you can say, I feel proud of myself. And this is a form of taking pleasure in some value which you have achieved, some action which you have successfully performed. And here, of course, pride then refers to an emotional state. But in the context of tonight's discussion, as a virtue, the primary meaning of pride is this attitude of moral ambitiousness. Moral ambitiousness is the meaning of pride in relationship to consciousness. In relation to existence, it consists of selfishness, the attitude, the principle, the policy of selfishness. But just as you must understand what is moral perfection, so you must understand what is selfishness. To be selfish means to be concerned with one's own interests. To be selfish means to live for one's own sake and by one's own mind. Selfishness does not mean the sacrifice of others to self. It is here that the objectivist concept of selfishness differs crucially from the conventional concept. In conventional morality, as you know, man is confronted with only two moral alternatives. To be selfless and sacrifice himself to others, or to be selfish and sacrifice others to himself. As historical symbols of this issue, men have been told, in effect, that the only choice is Christ or Hitler. To quote from Rourke's courtroom speech, quote, As poles of good and evil, man was offered two conceptions, egoism and altruism. Egoism was held to mean the sacrifice of others to self. Altruism, the sacrifice of self to others. This tied man irrevocably to other men and left him nothing but the choice of pain, his own pain born for the sake of others or pain inflicted upon others for the sake of self. When it was added that man must find joy in self-immolation, the trap was closed. Man was forced to accept masochism as his ideal under the threat that sadism was his only alternative. This was the greatest fraud ever perpetrated upon mankind. This was the device by which dependence and suffering were perpetuated as fundamentals of life. The choice is not self-sacrifice or domination. The choice is independence or dependence. Close quote. Observe, and this is one of the major points in the Fountainhead, that the man who sacrifices others is as selfless as the man who sacrifices himself. Both are total dependents, both live through others, both make others the goal of their life, neither lives by his own mind. Masochism and sadism are not opposites. They are two sides of the same coin. Just as it would be preposterous for a psychologist to assert that masochism and sadism are man's only alternatives, so it is preposterous and monstrous for a moralist to assert it. I'm sure that all of you have run up against the following phenomenon. One has only to enter into a discussion with a stranger 
on the subject of ethics and to make the statement that one advocates a morality of self-interest in order to invite an explosive reply of some such kind as the following. What? You believe in trampling over people and doing whatever you feel like doing? Don't you have any respect for the rights of anybody else? You think it's just right to murder or rape or rob or do anything you want just so you get what you want? A rational man does not perceive his self-interest in the violation of the rights of others, nor in exploiting them, nor in robbing and murdering them. It is an interesting commentary on the souls of conventional moralists that they do think that this is what self-interest consists of. When you announce that yours is an ethics of self-interest, all a listener can know so far is that you are repudiating the ethics of altruism. The logical question which he should ask you is, and what do you think is to man's self-interest? Then you proceed to tell, to spell out, what is the content of your moral code. When you announce that yours is an ethics of self-interest, this is really an introduction. It's not yet a statement as to what your ethics is all about. Because the big question is, what is to your self-interest? What is to man's self-interest? What does it depend on? And it's the job of a rational ethicist precisely to answer those questions, to define what does man's self-interest consist of. A morality that holds life as its standard of value is by that very fact, I want you to notice, necessarily a morality of egoism, of self-interest, of selfishness. There is nothing more selfish than wanting to live. There is nothing more selfish than breathing. But like life and like happiness, that which constitutes your self-interest is not arbitrary. It is not a matter of personal whim. It is not an issue that can be divorced from reason, reality, and your own nature. If a man is to be selfish, that is, to be concerned with his own self-interest, he is obliged to face such questions as, what does my self-interest consist of? What goal should I seek in life which will be maximally contributory to my self-interest? By what principles should I act in dealing with reality and other men if I am to secure my self-interest? If he is not concerned to deal with those questions, he cannot in any legitimate or serious sense be said to be concerned with his self-interest. Because to be concerned with your self-interest means to give the issue of your self-interest some sort of thought or rational consideration. If you don't, if you act like a range of the moment animal, it's true that you're not, in that case, motivated by concern for the interests of others. But that doesn't mean that you're motivated by the concern for the interests of self. It means you're acting without thinking one way or the other. Don't assume that if an action is not altruistic, it's therefore to your self-interest. Let me give you a simple example. If I were to pick up a hammer and start beating myself over the head, this would clearly not be an act of altruism. I hope you will agree it would not be an act of altruism. <laughs> would it then follow that it would be an act of selfishness? Would it be an act expressive of my self-interest? Clearly not. It would be a self-destructive action. It wouldn't, it's true, be an action aimed at anybody else's benefit, but by no stretch of the imagination could it be said to be aimed at my benefit. Therefore, 
There are actions which are to our self-interest and actions which are not to our self-interest. Of those actions which are not to our self-interest, some are aimed at the interests of others. Others aren't aimed at anybody's interests, one's own or anybody else's. So let's be very clear upon this and don't imagine that the alternative is simply your interests or the interests of others. The man who acts against reason is not selfish. It is not selfish to make oneself unfit for dealing with the facts of reality. The man who acts on the blind impulse of the moment is not selfish. It is not selfish to renounce one's rational faculty. The man who robs and murders is not selfish. It is not selfish to end one's life in the electric chair or to spend it in terror hiding from the police or to spend it in terror, wondering which member of one's gang is going to seek to replace one. The man who aspires to the position of dictator is not selfish. It is not selfish to require a food taster and to spend one's existence in part real, part paranoid terror that one may be assassinated at any moment by those conspiring to take one's place. The man who tries to live as something other than man is not selfish. It is not selfish to slap one's own nature in the face. It is selfish to remain loyal to one's mind. It is selfish to place no value above one's own rational judgment. It is selfish to pursue the values proper to one's own nature, the values that make life and happiness possible. It is selfish to deal with other men, not as a master or a slave, but as a trader, to give value for value, neither to grant nor demand the unearned. It is selfish to want to live and to learn to deserve it. In Miss Rand's most recent work, The Virtue of Selfishness, to which I contributed a few essays, you will find the fullest non-fiction delineation of precisely what the objectivist concept of selfishness means. And you will find in this book a great deal of material, supplementary and complementary, not only to this immediate discussion, but to the whole discussion of ethics. I am deliberately omitting, insofar as it's possible, those aspects of the objectivist ethics which are now available to you in The Virtue of Selfishness. But I do want to point out a few more aspects, a few more confusions relevant to the issue of selfishness. As I need hardly tell you, there probably isn't any issue about which there is more incredible confusion than over this issue. Altruism has acquired such a monopoly in men's minds that they virtually regard altruism as synonymous with morality or with goodness. They don't regard altruism as one particular theory of morality. They regard altruism as synonymous with morality and selfishness as, of course, synonymous with evil. You will remember at the end of part one of The Fountainhead when Rourke turns down the commission at a time when he's financially desperate and his career seems ended before it's scarcely begun and when he refuses to make certain changes in the design of a building one of the directors of the corporation says to him, how can you be so fanatical and selfless? And Rourke looks at him in astonishment and says, this is the most selfish thing you've ever seen a man do. Well, of course, the director who asks Rourke this question is thinking in terms of the entirely conventional frame of reference. What he can understand Rourke's action as is only an issue of, quote, selflessness, close quote. Rourke recognizes, of course, that it is the most selfish thing that a man could do precisely because Rourke's policy is he will not relinquish, sacrifice, subordinate his values for anything. If that isn't selfishness, what does selfishness mean? But so profoundly are people brainwashed over the issue of selfishness 
that one hears incredible misinterpretations and distortions of the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, not only from the enemies of the books, but also from the friends. I remember some years ago meeting a man who was very enthusiastic over the Fountainhead and spoke to me for a few minutes about what a wonderful, inspiring book it was and how much he'd enjoyed reading it, and etc. and so forth. And then he remarked, what a marvelously selfless person Rourke was. If he wanted, in effect, to say Rourke is good or morally great, he calls him selfless. And all of the book didn't penetrate or break up that notion in his mind. Many people were very distressed over the Fountainhead because, distressed on just this count, because conventionally uh, they would recognize that Peter Keating would be what is conventionally called selfish, except, as the book makes perfectly clear, Keating hasn't got any self whatsoever. He's only a reflection of the values of others. And Rourke, who in many ways is the opposite, in fact, in all fundamental ways, is the opposite of Keating, the problem is you can't exactly call him selfless either. Yet you can't call him selfish, because selfish means Peter Keating. And many people would go away muttering that Ayn Rand is confused. <laughs> because they do not know how to think or will not think outside the conventional square. They are caught in a certain vice on this issue, and they cannot take a fresh look at what is the issue of selfishness and self-sacrifice all about. What does it mean in reality? One of the characteristics of an innovator in any field of endeavor is precisely this ability to look past the standard definitions, the standard formulas, that which everybody else takes as the given and to question the, the assumptions or the presuppositions in a given field on a deeper level than his contemporaries have done. And that, of course, is exactly what Miss Rand has done in the field of ethics. She has thought beneath this conventional assumption that the choice is, in effect, sacrifice of self for others or others for self. It is said, in effect, a plague on both your houses, because both represent evils. Again, have we not been told that selfishness is the antonym of love, that love requires selflessness? By this theory, it is not to your self-interest to find other men who share your values. It's not to your self-interest to find human beings you can respect and admire human beings who face existence as you face it and who embody the same values and practice the same virtues. Well, then what would be to your self-interest? What would you want if you were really selfish? To spend your life surrounded by men for whom you feel contempt? To spend your life without anyone who shares your values? It is in love above all else that you express yourself because what we love is the embodiment of our values in another person. A friend, said Aristotle, is another self. And it is with the person one loves that one feels freest to be oneself. This is not selfless. Pause on this last point. One of the significant criteria which affect us when we are falling in love, usually it affects most people subconsciously rather than consciously, is the thought, with this person I could be fully myself, I could express myself on more levels and more dimensions than with anybody else, because this person's way of thinking and feeling about life is like mine, and therefore I would have more affinities and more values to share and more levels of communication possible with this person than with any other. If these are not selfish considerations, what are they? Love would be selfless only if one practices an altruist morality. That is, if one were compelled to give one's love 
not to that which one admires, but to that which one deplores, not to that in which one sees values, but to that in which one sees flaws. The advocates of altruism are right from the point of view of their code when they hold pride as the worst of man's sins. No man of authentic pride will accept the doctrine that virtue consists of self-immolation. That requires the altruist virtue of humility, which means a miserable inferiority complex. Again, I want to remind you of a very significant statement in the Fountainhead, very relevant to our media discussion. I quote by memory, and therefore it's not verbatim, but it's in Tui's big final speech to Keating. And he, when he tells Keating that if a person is preaching self-sacrifice, preaching sacrifice, it stands to reason that there has to be somebody there to collect the sacrificial offerings and that he intends to be the collector. But if a person tells you that you have a right to live for your own happiness, that's the person who isn't seeking to exploit you. That's the person who isn't seeking to use you. That's the person who proposes to leave you free. And then too, he goes on to say, but let such a man come along and you'll run screaming your empty heads off that he's a selfish monster. So the racket, meaning the altruist racket, is safe for many, many centuries. It is a paradox that this incredible doctrine of altruism and self-sacrifice, this advocacy of humility, this constant preachment that man is born to suffer, to endure, to despise himself, to relinquish, to give up, to surrender, to renounce, is hailed as an ethics of benevolence and brotherly love. That is truly one of the most remarkable facts of human philosophical history, that such a hoax, such a fraud would have been, could have been perpetrated for so many centuries and accepted by so many people. Next week, I will turn to a discussion of the morality of altruism, to a more detailed analysis of what the creed of self-sacrifice is all about, what are its philosophical presuppositions, what view of life does it entail and imply, what are its consequences. Many of you might think, perhaps some of you think, that uh, in Galt's characterization of what the altruist ethics is all about in uh, his radio speech, he states in a too extreme way what the mystic altruists are preaching or advocating. So next week, I am going to do something which I think you'll find rather interesting. I'm going to do some juxtaposing of paragraphs from Galt's speech with quotations from a variety of theologians and philosophers and ethicists. And uh, you can judge for yourself whether or not Galt's characterization of what altruism means and what the advocates of altruism stand for is a correct one or not. You may be startled at some of the quotations which you'll hear read to you. So, to be continued next week. <laughs>